each and every one of you. Uh, it's just wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much for coming out uh, to worship with us here in North Clare. Isn't it great to just come and meet with the living God? Just to know the living God. But to be able to come with brothers and sisters and corporately experience God's presence. You know, I, I pray we never get hardened or indifferent to the presence of God in our lives. You know, and I know often, you know, I do. Often I do, but I thank God for those tender moments as He just he ministers again. And just even this morning, you know, just there was weeping there as we were just worshiping, just the presence of God. That we can be in the presence of Almighty God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Well, I pray we, I pray we just we cherish what God is doing both in our lives and in, in this area. Well, this morning, folks, as John has already mentioned, um, you know, this month the emphasis is on prayer, uh, particularly, and um, I suppose I want to look at a few aspects of prayer this morning to, to further encourage us in regards to prayer, uh, both the importance of it, the effectiveness of it and that, and, and just how healthy it is. You know, as God's children, we have access to talk to our Heavenly Father, and just how you know, we desire our children to come running to us and to share their lives with us, and, but also to, to ask us um, to help them with their needs, with their struggles and that, and, uh, and to help them in times of trouble. So our Heavenly Father welcomes us um, in all these scenarios. He desires us come to Him. And prayer, as we know, is basically talking to God. It's, it's communication between ourselves and the Lord, you know, talking to and listening to God. But it's in its most basic form, it's just communicating with God. And um, I'm sure we, we all understand that. And last week, Brian done a great job through, the, through his teaching in Philippians, didn't he, of, of bringing out how, how God wants to help us. And, and the aspect is through prayer. And he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. So in all circumstances, you know, we're to pray with thanksgiving, pray. You know, present your request to God present our supplications to God, and then God promises to help us. He promises then to give us peace, but the Holy Spirit which guards our heart and our minds in Christ Jesus. And so it's absolutely beautiful. You know, God wants to help us, and He does that as we engage with Him in prayer, and it's really, it's really good. So this morning, I want to expound a little bit more really on prayer and to further encourage us to see the importance of it and the benefit of it. So will we pray together that the that the Lord would speak to us, and that we'd be open this morning to be encouraged. We'd be open today to, to really hear a message from the Lord, and uh, just as we look at God's Word together. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that this morning you're here with us. Thank you for your presence, Lord, through your Spirit here. And Lord, I thank you for your Word. And Lord, I pray today, just as we open your Word, that you will speak to our hearts. You'd encourage us with it, Lord. You would, um, yeah, just teach us again. Refresh us with those wonderful truths, Lord, uh, through your word today. Uh, Lord, we just pray that we'd be open to hear and receive. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, recently I, I read a quote about prayer, and it said that prayer is God's method of carrying out His purposes upon the earth. Prayer is God's method of carrying out His purposes upon the earth. In other words, God is seeking to carry out His plans and purposes upon the earth, and He chooses to do that somehow through prayer. It's a very interesting quote, isn't it? And sort of the first time I read it, I thought, mm, you know, is it, is it, you know? And they started to look at it. And um, I want to draw his attention to a verse. I'm going to go through a lot of verses today. Uh, just regarding prayer. But one of the verses is found in Matthew 9, verse 37, 38. Jesus declared, and he's really implying this truth. Jesus declared to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So Jesus begins, and he lays out an issue that there is there. The harvest. You know, so many people need to hear about the Lord in that. So many people need to give, uh, be given the opportunity to repent and come into God's kingdom. The harvest is there but the laborers are few. So those who are active in working for God, 
in sharing this message are few. So does Jesus then say, so I'm just laying out the scenario to you, but don't worry about it. God's going to sort it all. Let's just leave it to God. Jesus continues, and he brings out something here. Verse 38, therefore, or in light of what I'm just after telling you, that the harvest is, is plentiful, the labors are few, in light of that fact, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray that the Lord would send out laborers into his harvest. So, the Lord, so the, this verse is implying that, I suppose, the Lord's actions are in some way directly connected to responding to the prayers of His people. This is what Jesus is implying. It's interesting here, isn't it? You know, this verse is teaching us that we have an important role to play in this. Jesus doesn't just lay it out and then says, don't worry about it. He says, because of that, I want you to do something, church. My people, I want you to engage in something. He asks us to pray, to intercede. This is very, very interesting. And um, I know we can never fully understand the mystery of this, the mystery of prayer and how, how it works fully. But we need to look at what is revealed about prayer to us and then walk in obedience to that. And that's, where, that's the starting place for us. What does God's Word tell us about prayer, and what does He ask us to do in regards to prayer? And then one day, God is going to reveal, when we're with Him fully, how it all linked together and synced together, and God's perfect plans, and, you know, sovereign God and His perfect, you know, will, and how that links together with a praying people and seeing it, um, His will unfold on the earth. But there is a mystery with it, somewhat. But let's look at what is revealed about it to us. So, we start off with knowing, first of all, it's a healthy thing for God's people to pray. It is really healthy for us. And we also know that it's Jesus commands us to do this. You know, Brian talked about the, the healthiness of it the last week, you know, how we can have the peace of God uh, in our lives and that. So, definitely being in that relationship with our, with our Heavenly Father and talking to Him openly, communicating, it brings a peace it's lovely. I love the way that he brought it. Do not be anxious about it. Don't have a torn mind about life and about situations. Instead, just pray and to know then God's peace uh, in garden our lives. But we also see that Jesus commands his people to pray. So there's benefits, but it's also a command of Jesus to pray. Scripture also tells us that prayer is effective. And maybe we're not fully convinced of that kind of think, oh, I don't know, I'm shooting some things up to the Lord, and I don't know whether it's effective or not. Well, you see, the Word of God tells us, James chapter 5, verse 16, that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And here's a really good example of it, because he goes on to say in verse 17, that Elijah was a man with a nature like yours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed later that it would rain, and it rained. And this is the example that James has given us. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I want to encourage us when we think of this this morning. How are we righteous this morning? We're righteous because of Christ's imputed righteousness in our life. Don't think that we're going to stand before God and our prayers are heard because in our flesh we're living, you know, to a certain standard, and that's the acceptance we can come before God. We're righteous because of what Christ has done on the cross for us this morning. So if we're in Christ, as the New Testament teaches us, our prayers are effective. They're heard. They avail much. That's really, really good for us to know. Now, repeatedly through Scripture, just want to throw out some verses here to show us that we're instructed to pray. Okay, so I'm just building some foundational stuff here for us, some truths that we need to be reminded of continually here in our lives. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you. 
and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So God's people are told to call to him, and he will answer. He's going to show us what we need. He's going to give direction to our lives. Call to me. But he's also, you see in that scripture there, he's ordained to answer. It's a promise that he's going to answer us. So already we're learning our prayers are effective. They're commanded by Jesus. They're effective. And also that because um, we're being obedient to call to him, that he will answer us. So these are important little truths for us to be reminded of. Ephesians 6 verse 17 we're encouraged to pray. Take the helmet of salvation, Paul tells us, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So praying always, Paul tells us in Ephesians. What about 1 Thessalonians 5, 16? It says, rejoice always, Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we're to pray ceaselessly. We're to be in that place of continual prayer before the Lord. This is what, he's, uh, what the Scripture is teaching us. And you know, the more that I look at the Bible, the more I look at Scripture and what it says about prayer, the more I'm convinced here that situations change, not so much by, by planning and strategy and dialogue and that, but through prayer. All those things are good. It's really good to plan. It's really good to communicate. But the most important thing for us to be doing is communicating with the Lord about everything. And this is why, you know, on Sunday mornings, we start, because the focus is um, a month of prayer, we want to start at 10 o'clock first, communicating with the Heavenly Father. First of all, let's really spend some time communicating with the Heavenly Father. And so hopefully we're, we're encouraging each other as a, as a congregation how to apply that principle in our own lives. Yes, we start with prayer on a Sunday morning, but may it stir us all to remember to start with prayer on a Monday morning, on a Tuesday morning, on a Wednesday morning, you know, when the pressures of, of work is there. May we still have that principle, I'm going to get up a bit earlier, spend a bit of time in the Lord's presence. Things change through prayer. James 4 verse 2 should encourage us about this aspect of prayer. It says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Sometimes we're striving about something in the flesh, and we've really forgot to start our day and ask the Lord about the situation. Or we're strategizing or thinking about something for ourselves, but we haven't really laid it down before the Lord. And we haven't focused in and said, Lord, here's the need. I'm asking you to meet this need. James clearly tells us here, you do not have because you do not ask. What about that verse earlier that it, uh, from Jeremiah? Call to me and I will answer you. So church, I want to encourage us this morning to be calling to God with a prayer request, asking the Lord for specific uh, requests and really having uh, faith to believe that God is, as Hebrews says, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God will answer. God rewards those who seek him wants to spend time in his presence, putting him first in our day, first in our week, first in our life. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What about Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11? The scripture say there, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and he who knocks, it will be opened. So do you see the encouragement? Hopefully we're, we're, we're getting the gist of this encouragement to call to the Lord, to ask, to knock, to seek, spend time in the Lord's presence, put him first. He promises to hear us. He promises to answer. He tells us through his word that our prayers are effective. God's a rewarder for those who seek him. 
Let's be encouraged to pray. Think of Scripture, of, or think of other Scriptures where God answered people's prayer. What about the Gentile Cornelius? He prayed, and God answered him and sent him Peter, didn't they? Peter explained the gospel to him, and he got saved, and his family came to know the Lord and that. But it said that Cornelius was praying to God. God heard his prayer. God ministered. I think it's beautiful. I mentioned that example of Elijah. You know how God answered prayer. Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain. Three and a half years. Then Elijah prayed again that it would rain, and it rained. All through Scripture, we haven't time this morning, but you know, there's just so many examples of people who prayed and God answered their prayers. So as I said earlier on, I'm convinced, increasingly convinced, that to see situations change, rather than focusing on the dialogue at the horizontal level, we need to first focus on the dialogue at the vertical level. This is what Scripture is encouraging us. And out of that relationship, then dialogue at the horizontal level. And let's, you know, try doors at the horizontal level. See, if you're praying about something, you're praying about, or if you're concerned about something, say it's the next opportunity, the next career step or something. First pray. First bring it to the Lord. The vertical is the focus. First And seek the Lord. And then from that, explore the opportunities, the, the possibilities. Try the doors. You know, s speak to the, the people who, who, who could make things happen, who could direct you in the right way. Try doors and everything else after you've spent time in the Lord's presence. This, this is the, I suppose, the, um, the method for us that I want us to get from this. The importance of prayer and so that we would run first to prayer with the Lord, and then we'd um, work on the horizontal stuff. Now, you might be saying, Steve, that all sounds great, but I've prayed. You don't understand my situation. I've prayed, and I'm not getting an answer to my prayers. So what's the deal with that? I don't seem to be getting this answer. I'm calling to God, but I don't hear his answer. I don't see the answer that I'm, that I'm desiring. So, so what's, the, what's the story about that there? Well, first of all, I want to encourage us, don't be discouraged when God doesn't immediately answer our prayers. His promises are true. Remember the character of God. God is a covenant making and a covenant, can anyone tell me? Keeping God. Let's all say that God is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. His word is true. And we need to remember that. And because we don't see the answer immediately in our situation, that doesn't mean that God's word is not true. So what's going on in this situation? Well, first of all, I want to encourage us, don't be discouraged. What does Jesus say? And he, gives that, he tells that parable of the persistent widow in Luke, I think it's Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. And he tells us a parable to encourage the disciples, he says, to pray and not lose heart. See, sometimes when we could pray in about something continually, we can become discouraged. We can lose heart and think, oh, I'm just going to give up on that. But Jesus tells this parable so we won't lose heart. So we will be encouraged to pray and not lose heart. And we, we haven't time really to, to look at the whole parable, but just to get a, a couple of verses of it. Yeah, it says verse 1 there, yeah. Jesus spoke this parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And um, in verse 6, it says, And shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long for them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. God is saying, you know, there's a, there's a, a judge in this scenario, there's a widow coming to him, and um, she wants justice. And through her persistence, the judge gives justice. 
And God said, listen, if man can do this, how much more is your heavenly Father not going to hear you when you persist in prayer? Jesus tells us this parable that we would pray and not lose heart. So if you don't see an answer to your prayer straight away, don't lose heart this morning. Pray, persist in prayer. Now, several reasons why maybe we don't see an answer immediately to prayers. You know, one of them is that sometimes there's spiritual opposition to our prayers. Daniel chapter 10, for example, tells us this, that how Daniel prayed and an angel came in response to his prayers. But what happened? The answer was delayed for three weeks in Daniel, we read. Three weeks. There was a delay. And, um, but even as you read Daniel chapter 10, we don't have time to, to read it this morning. I encourage you to do it. In Daniel chapter 10, it says that God heard Daniel when he first prayed. And he sent the answer. But there was a spiritual battle. There was opposition. And for three weeks, there was opposition. But God heard the prayer straight away. And this is why we're encouraged to pray in thanksgiving. Remember in that Philippians 4 uh, passage, it talked about, you know, present our, our prayers to God, but with thanksgiving. You see, God hears us straight away. So we should say, Lord, thank you. You hear me as I'm calling out to you now. Thank you. I'm not praying just to an empty room. Thank you. Your, your eyes are on the righteous. Your ears attentive to the prayers, the Word tells us. So thank you, Lord, for hearing me. But we as a church need to be aware that there's a spiritual dynamic here. There's spiritual opposition to God's work and to things happening. And if we're seeking to step up in our lives, make ourselves available for God, we're going to be opposed as well. And so we need to be prayerful and aware that there can be spiritual opposition here. Ephesians 6 tells us this, verse 12 and 13 that it tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to say, so take up the armor of God. This is the reality. So there's a, sometimes our prayers can be opposed. The answers can be hindered. Why? Because the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places opposed to what God is doing. But we're not to give up. We're to persist in prayer. As Jesus says, persist in prayer. Don't lose heart. You know, we need to, we need to have great, great hope. And this morning, I want to remind us of Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, that because of the cross, all those spiritual hosts of wickedness and everything else. Because of the cross, Colossians 2.15 tells us they've been defeated. Jesus has disarmed the principalities and powers. He's made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them. When did he do it? At the cross. There was death and resurrection. So yes, there is, there is spiritual powers of darkness and wickedness, and Christ has triumphed over them completely triumphed over them. He's been victorious. So he's defeated the foe. And you know, there may be like parting blows of the enemy, but he's a defeated foe. He may still shout and roar to try to scare his body, but he's powerless. He's disarmed. Christ has disarmed him. And so we need to be aware of this and not intimidated by how, how loudly he shouts. He's been disarmed. He's been like a, you know, a, a wild animal that, that's, that's chained up anymore, or that's chained up now. He can't affect us. He might roar and, uh, and all the rest of it, but we don't need to be scared. He's bound. He's disarmed. He's toothless. But we need to be aware of what Christ has done. So important for us. And remember that the... the the spiritual work, as was prayed this morning, um, I can't remember, it might have been up, up in the prayer meeting, but it's not by might or not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So important to realize this. God's church will be built his way, you know, by his spirit. 
primarily. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Okay. We're further encouraged when we're worried to cast our cares upon the Lord. First Timothy tells us this. Brian mentioned it last week, not to be anxious. So when we face situations, I want us to see this. Don't be anxious, pray. Cast our cares. It's not that the body, it's not that we as Christians don't have concerns. But what do we do with those concerns? If we try to think we've got to sort them ourselves, then we'll end up with that torn mind. We'll end up full of anxiety and worry. But if we learn to be disciplined to cast our cares on the Lord, that means, you know, throw them on the Lord. Don't try to share them with the Lord. Lord, cast your cares. Lord, here's my worries. Here's my concerns. Lord, they're yours. I'm your child. Just lead me and guide me. Just tell me where to step, how to step. The concern of it is all yours, Lord. And it's such a freedom with that. Cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for us. It's beautiful. And I do believe that Sometimes as Christians, we can miss out on the peace that God promises us by just holding on to these cares and concerns ourselves. You know, there's some of the great, uh, some of the, the Christian songs of the past have some great truth in them as well. And there was one that was penned by um, Joseph Scriven back in 1857. And he really brought this out, this truth about I suppose Christians not availing of the peace that is theirs because they don't pray, they don't give God, they don't cast the concerns on, on God. And um, he wrote this song, and it's titled, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I'm sure some of you know it. I'm just going to read through the lyrics uh, for us. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So he understands, take everything to God in prayer. But then he brings out, he says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He continues, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? You know, these are obvious things. Of course, there's trials and temptations. Of course, there's troubles in this life. He says, but we should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And he talks about burdens and that. And he says, are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And he talks about opposition in that from people. And he says, do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. Blessed, blessed Savior, you have promised. You will all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to you in earnest prayer. Soon in glory, bright unclouded, there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. You know, may we understand that. Go home and look it up too, you know, if you don't know the hymn already. And think about the words of it again. He's, he's put to, to, in a hymn, scriptural truth about prayer. We, we're not supposed to carry this crippling burdens that we do, that we often, um, I suppose, encounter in life. God wants us to cast our cares on Him rather than carry them ourselves. And sometimes we miss out the joy and the lightness and the brightness of life in Christ because we're still carrying these burdens instead of praying and allowing God to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ as we've been learning the last couple of weeks. So church, let's be encouraged to pray. Pray, cast our cares on the Lord. You know, a couple of final points in relation to prayer here. I want us to, you know, we're encouraged through Scripture, pray with a thankful heart. You know, we should praise Him for who He is, praise Him for what He has done, praise Him for what He is doing and God's sustaining grace, praise Him for the promises that are ours in Him for the future, what He's going to do. He's faithful. Praise Him, He's coming again. 
Isn't it wonderful? Praise God, he's going to prepare a place for us. Praise God, you know, he's the bridegroom, we're the bride. There's going to be the married supper of the Lamb. Thank God for this. Thank God he promises to meet every need that we have in Christ. It's so good to know this. In Christ, Peter tells us we have all that we need for life and godliness. Do we get up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you today. I have every single thing I need for the life you've called me to. Rather than get up and, oh, you know, I need something. I'm coveting the next thing. It's, Lord, in you, I have everything. So remind me of the things I need to pray for. Remind me this morning of the things I need to commit to you, that I would walk in your will. I would walk in your way, walk in your plans for life. Start with thanks. Start with praise. And, you know, I want to encourage us as a congregation to grow in this aspect. Thankful hearts full of praise unto our great Savior for what he has done for us. So we should be thankful. We should pray. Um, oh, there's so many aspects here to prayer. We should pray in faith. We should pray in the Holy Spirit. These are all nearly subjects in the room. I haven't time to get into them all. So many aspects of prayer here. But I want to close with, with just one aspect. And we talked about it on, at the midweek meeting. I want to just very briefly mention a couple of points about praying with a burden. We had a great time. Um, a, a few got together, uh, the care team, just to pray through for the leadership of the church and that. And we just, I felt to share, but just pray for a breakthrough. Uh, you know, be burdened to, to pray. And um, Nehemiah, if you want to open your Bibles, flick over to Nehemiah. Just a couple of verses I'm going to read from Nehemiah. Situation, Nehemiah is, you know, uh, the Babylonians have taken into captivity God's people. And for 70 years, they're in captivity in Babylon. And then um, they start to go back. A few start to go back. And they've rebuilt the temple. Then a few years later, um, more go back. And finally, Nehemiah goes back with his heart to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem so that the people, his people, would be able to worship without fear of attack. So there was a defensive wall to be built. Nehemiah's burden to build this. And that's, that's the uh, scenario. And Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm uh, just going to summarize the first little verse here in that, that um, he asks in verse 2, one of his brethren who came with the men from Judah, he asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity, he asked them about the situation of Jerusalem. So he first inquires, he first inquires sorry, about how is Jerusalem doing? What's the current situation? Verse 3, and they said to me, the survivors are left from the captivity in the province, are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, gates are burned with fire. So hey, the report's not good. So it was, verse 4, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So here now he's, he's grieved in his heart, doesn't he? about the situation that his, his brethren find themselves in. He's grieved in his heart. And, he, and he's wanting to go and ask the king to go back. But what does he do first of all? Before he does that, he goes to the king of kings. And he says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant. Remember we said he's a covenant-keeping God. Nehemiah knows that. So he prays that you're a covenant-keeping God. Keep your covenant and mercy with those who love and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. And so he goes, Nehemiah goes to God in prayer for the sake of time. Verse 8, remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses. And on down, verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the king, King Artaxerxes, for I was the king's cupbearer. So Nehemiah is going to approach the king. That's the horizontal thing. He's going to ask for permission to go back. But what does he do first? He does what we should do. He first goes to the king of kings, and he says, Lord, I'm burdened. Will you intercede? Will you make a way? And I, I just love it. And he starts with, remember your word. 
Nehemiah praised God's word to God. And this is a great, great principle for God's people. If we want to pray God's will, learn to pray God's word. If you want to pray God's will, learn to pray God's word. That's the starting place here. Approaching the King of Kings, reminding him of his word, his promises, his heart. And then, Lord, making yourself available. Lord, there's a burden in my heart. I'm grieved for the situation. I'm available. What do you want me to do? Make a way. Make a way. And this is the principle for us all. Pray with a burden. But first approach the King of Kings with the burden for direction on how then to, to minister. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, I know our time's gone, folks, so I'm going to have to skip here. But I want to finish with one verse. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. May we have humility to know that we need God when we get up in the morning, first and foremost. We need God's wisdom as we face into the day to make business decisions and school decisions and, and interactions with our, our husbands, our wives, or our children. May we seek God's wisdom, not be proud and think, I know what to do, but may we be first in prayer. God, make me the person today that I should be for what you've got for me. And to see him minister, to see him then empower us to be all that he desires us to be for his glory. This is prayer month for the church. Be encouraged. God hears us when we pray. Be encouraged. Our prayers are effective. Yes, there's a spiritual battle raging over our lives, raging over our families, raging over this church, raging over the community, over Ireland, over the world. But know that God is the one who wants to fight on our behalf. And he's told us just simply what to do, not to be overburdened with it, to the point of breaking, but when we feel burdened, to pray. Say, Lord, here, I feel your bitterness on my heart, so I'm going to pray about the situation, knowing that my prayers are effective. My prayers are effective. And when we pray according to God's will, God answers. He ministers. So our prayer needs to be, God, what's on your heart? And then break my heart for what's on your heart, God. Church, will we stand as we close in prayer? And let's pray just for that, that fresh outpouring of God's Spirit on us as individuals, but corporately as a church, that we would be available for what God desires to do and realize it's through prayer. There's this meeting up of God's will and using His people for His plans and purpose as we pray and make ourselves available. And learn to, let's pray as a people God's word. Remember his promises. God's told us, hey, that he's going to build his church. Anyone excited about that? He's going to build his church and what? The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. I believe part of that church is going to be here in North Clare. I believe it. He's building his church. His word's going out. This is where he's called us. I believe God's building his church in West Clare. I believe God's building his church in East Clare. In other parts of Ireland. Globally. But it, we're part of it. And he's building his church in the gates of hell. All that spiritual host of wickedness now will not prevail against God's church. So let's be a praying people this week. Pray in confidence 
but with a humility. Lord, we know you've won the victory. It's all about you, Jesus. Now, just carry me into what you have for me this day. Carry me into what you have for me this week for your glory. And as God lays a burden on your heart, pray effectively for it. As God lays a person on your mind, pray for them. And your prayers are effective. God will release chains from people. God will set captives free. God will bring healing to people. God wants to minister. Let's have faith and believe. It's another whole sermon we need to pray in faith. Maybe we'll, we'll tackle that the next time. But we need to pray in faith, believe, and God is going to answer. So come on, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you this morning. Lord, we thank you. Lord, just that we've been able to experience your presence, Lord, this morning. Thank you for the richness of just being in your presence. But thank you for your word today, Lord. I thank you for the wonderful truths of your word. Thank you for just your, your rich promises, Lord, that, Lord, that we have access before your throne. Lord, that we can call upon you. We can carry our requests and supplications to you, and you hear us. Lord, your eyes are on your righteous. Your ears are attentive to our prayers. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that um, today, Father, we can have full confidence, Lord, that you hear us. And so today, we just want to lift ourselves before you. We want to say, Lord Jesus, have your way in our lives this day. Lord, we come with our burdens, our concerns and cares, and we cast them on you. Today, Lord, we cast our cares on you because you care for us. And Lord, I thank you today the confidence we can have that our prayers are effective. So Lord, today, corporately we stand and we pray for ourselves as a congregation. We pray for ourselves as a body here, Lord. Lord, that fear will be removed and that faith would rise here, Lord, in this place. Lord, we pray that you would take us out as a beacon of light in Clare for you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, Lord, raise us up, Lord, for your glory, not our own, Lord. Oh, Jesus, give, Lord, everyone here, Lord, just opportunities this week, Lord, to be in prayer and to be praying effectively for people, for situations, Lord. I pray for anyone here, Lord, who, who is seeking direction. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will guide them. Lord, anyone here is seeking, Lord, um, help, Lord, uh, or healing, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will provide for them, Lord, that you will bring healing this week, Lord. Oh, Jesus, I pray, Lord, for anyone here who's unsaved members in their family, Lord, this week. I pray, God, as they pray, Lord, that you would just burden those members, Father, and bring them into your kingdom. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just manifest your glory, Father, your presence, your glory over this congregation and over this land, Father, we pray. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, Father. Thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to just press into you. Lord, believe in, Lord, that uh, you hear us, Father. So we thank you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen, Lord.